way back in the day, uh, the Apostle John, near the end of his life, uh, he was the last surviving eyewitness to Jesus, the last surviving apostle was brought out to deliver a message to the gathered church. And this is my ambition, to be able to preach a message as short as the Apostle John's. He was brought out, and he gazed out at the crowd. They were just waiting. I mean, the apostles were all gone. This is the last one. This is a big deal. And he sort of like raised his crinkled form and gazed out at them and said, little children, love one another. And then he just got wheeled back in. <laughs> that was his sermon. Whoa. In a way, I feel like that's what I'm going to do tonight. We're talking about love. I'm going to unpack it a little more because uh, Apostle John just sort of make that sound profound and intense. And, you know, just like, ooh, I got goosebumps thinking about it. But uh, tonight's message is not complex. This is not rocket science. I hope that, that very little of any of this will be new information to you. Uh, love is at the foundation of the Christian life. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in one of the most famous passages, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. We're in a series right now, we're, we're concluding it, on 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, we read, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness, through our knowledge of Him who called us, by His own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Love is the final stop in our journey. We began with faith. We had several uh, uh, detours along the way. And now we're arriving at love. Love is the ultimate Christian virtue. God is love. And we are called to be like God. That's all well and good. But it really begs a very fundamental question. What is love? Love is a mini splendid thing. Um, <laughs> or, that I was going to use. What is love? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Um, It's this question that's out there. We all want to know what love is. Our society wants to know what love is. Each of us, we have ideas. We, we each have notions. And they're probably fairly accurate. It's not like this is, uh, you know, trying to figure out, like, what role epinephrine praise. You know, it's, 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 this is a relatively simple question. It's something we all have firsthand experience of. Loving and being loved. And, and growing in love for others. But defining love is actually pretty tricky. I, um, I remember several definitions of love that I heard along the way when I was sort of uh, in some formative years back in college, sort of think through these things. One guy said, love is a choice. Love is not an emotion. <clears throat> OK, great. Took notes, wrote that down, thought about it a lot. Uh, a little bit later, and someone tell me, uh, love is a conscious choice for the highest good of someone else. OK, great. Added on to my little notebook. Uh, a guy I really respect, Dick Pope, who's an astoundingly effective communicator, likes to say love is the accurate estimation and the adequate supply of another person's needs. <laughs> well, that sounds impressive. <laughs> love, in case you're not, love is the accurate estimation and the adequate supply of another person's needs. And I like those definitions. I found them helpful, but I also found them lacking in one or more areas. And I guess. Uh, what I want to say is this. I appreciate the fact that they put the emphasis on the fact that there is a choice, a matter of will involved, and that there's action, that you're doing something. Uh, too often we speak of love merely in emotive or, or you know, sort of ushy-gushy terms, especially romantic love. By default, if I say the word love, you assume that I mean romantic love, uh, when in fact we all love many more people than we will ever love romantically. Uh, so I like the fact that it puts the emphasis there, but the thing I don't like is it's, they seem like they're trying so hard to overcompensate for this trend in our culture that they forget that although love is more than a feeling, it's certainly not less than a feeling. Like, I would worry myself if 
I just made choices to be nice to my wife my whole life long. I think she'd be worried about that too. She'd like me to make those choices, but she would like me to make them because I feel certain things for her. I think my parents would be very disappointed if I only was like a dutiful son. Yes, you are my mother. Therefore, I owe you honor. I will honor you. You know? But there needs to be something more there than that. And so I began to think about what do I really think the essence of love is? And I just began noodling around, tossing around in my head, and I came up with a Venn diagram. Uh, this is not surprising to those of you. So, I have come to the conclusion that love is the overlap of three things. Now, let me add a disclaimer here, okay? This is not highly precise technical philosophy. I'm sure there's footnotes, qualifications that I've missed, but I do believe I've hit the most important things and I put the emphasis where it needs to lie. Uh, this is not totally in jest. There's something very serious here and I want you to pay attention to it. Love is the overlap of commitment, delight, and action. And I want to talk about each of those briefly and sort of highlight what they look like in our lives and why each of them is vital to love. And if you take them out, something very dysfunctional and irregular manifests in this place. So commit it. Uh, by commitment, what I mean is you're in it for the long haul. You are not just a uh, fly by night. Uh, and this is kind of obvious, right? Love involves commitment. What would it be like if you had delight, if you really enjoyed being around someone, if you really enjoyed something, like you know, hamburgers or something, uh, and you took the appropriate actions toward that person or this, this entity, but you had no commitment to it, what would that look like? You'd be like a zoo visitor, looking at the monkeys. Oh, the little monkeys, you make me laugh, I love the monkeys. Look, he's throwing poo at the other monkey, that's so funny. Oh, um, here's some peanuts, monkeys. And then you go home, and you don't think about the monkeys anymore. You were in and you were gone. Now that's sort of a silly example, but we do things like that in life all too frequently. In fact, come holidays, we're, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, we're coming up on Christmas. A lot of us are going to serve those who are less advantaged than ourselves. And if we're not careful, we'll be like zoo visitors. We'll go in, we'll throw them some peanuts, we'll go home and we'll feel good about ourselves. We're not committed to actually doing things that are in the best interest long term, to changing our culture, to creating policies of justice, to contributing towards charitable organizations on an ongoing basis, not just when, oh, I've got a lot of extra food, so I'll give some to them because I've got too many canned goods in the house. Love is commitment, and it manifests over the long haul. That's true in any arena you care to look at that lacks commitment. It's not true love. Now, that is one element of it, but if all you have is commitment, that's not even close to love. There's got to be uh, these other ingredients as well. The one that I want to focus on next, well, I put my notes in the wrong order. The one I want to focus on next is delight. What I mean by that is there's got to be something emotive happening. You've got to really like, you have to really enjoy, you have to really appreciate the thing that you claim to love. This seems like a no-brainer. Uh, but all too often, especially in Christian circles, we, we, we miss this very vital point. If you don't have positive feelings for something or someone, your claim to have love for them is defective. Now, I want to be clear about something. If you don't have positive feelings, I still want you to be kind and nice and gentle. Um, I don't want you to just slap people across the face, you know, spit it because you don't have this warm, fuzzy feeling inside of you. But as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, I would be very disturbed if I did not find myself liking more and more people the longer that I serve Christ and finding my, my little pickiness about who I hang out with and who I can tolerate and who I can stand to be around and who's, you know, little, you know clicking at their teeth sound or, you know, the way that they dress or the way that they smell or the, the way they phrase things drives me up the wall would go down and my tolerance and my love for them would go up. If that was not happening, I'd be very concerned about the state of my heart. As Christians, we are called to love people, and that includes liking them. It is vital that we, we reach a point in our life where the default is we genuinely enjoy people. We realize everyone's really made in God's image, and there's something beautiful and wonderful about even the worst person we'll ever meet. And the default is, I like you. Now, 
What happens if you've got commitment and action, but no delight? I alluded to this a little bit earlier. It's what I call the world's worst babysitter syndrome. Um, it's where you've got someone there who does all the right stuff. I'll change your diapers, kid. But they don't like kids. Or you ever had that teacher in, in high school or grade school, maybe? The one who, like, they did all the right stuff. They gave the test, they graded it, they did the papers, da -da -da, but they hated kids. People know when you don't like them. You've got to have likability for people somewhere in your makeup. And finally, actions. This is the one that I want to spend the most time on tonight. This is kind of no brainer. Like, unexpressed love is not really love at all. It's sort of, you know, duh. I told you at the beginning, none of this is rocket science. This is all pretty basic stuff. Uh, if you've got delight and commitment, but you've got no positive actions towards the person, what are you? You're like a football fan. You're sitting on the couch, you're like, yeah, go team! But then, you know, when that player, you know, who you're cheering for in that one play, you scored the big point, you know, clinched the game for your team, you know, gets, you know, a knee injury and then, like, has to retire, you know, after two years in the game, you're not calling that person up saying, hey, go over to my house for Christmas. Hey, I'll get you a job. Hey, let me, you know. You don't have any real connection. You're not really loving them. You maybe have a level of commitment to them. You take delight in what they can do for you. You're committed to them being there for you, but you're not serving them. You're not caring for them. Now, that is the most <coughs> superficial level of this analysis, but there's another level that's a little bit more important. Uh, it's not just that we take actions, it's that we take right actions. And this is where the Bible becomes so very important for followers of Christ. Jesus said, and actually we're going to look at this verse a little bit later, that love is the foundation of the whole law. All of God's will is contained in this one idea. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you do those two things well and thoroughly, everything else flows naturally from that. Now that's great if you're the world's clearest thinker. And in any situation you just go, ah! love means I buy a Coke instead of a Pepsi. Um, which love does mean that, by the way. <laughs> um, in case you didn't know, it's in the Apocrypha. Um, uh, love. Too many times in life. Like, that's the problem with utilitarian ethics, by the way. If you've ever had to study, or consequential ethics, if you've ever had to study some philosophy, the problem with them is they, they define, like, what, what the moral action is by being able to evaluate all the variables in the universe. And what it winds up being is you can't know what's good or evil until the end of all time. It's not very helpful when you've got to decide, am I going to give this guy five dollars or slap him? What's the right thing to do? Um, I just don't know. It depends. Is he Hitler or not? You know, you, you just don't know. And you tell it you're not. And that's the problem with starting from ground zero with love. Love is our only rule. That's why God gives us so many outworkings of what love means in the Bible. The whole book of Leviticus is an outworking of what love means in a very specific context. Uh, you read Paul's exhortations in Romans or Ephesians or the other books of the Bible. You hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's what love means in those situations that he addresses. Why is that so very vital to grasp? Because in our society, especially in the area of sexual ethics, we've reached this point where if we can't immediately understand how the morality fits together, how all the pieces of the puzzle go in right, then we're going to disregard whatever rules, whatever guidelines, whatever principles we see reflected, either in the Bible or from our parents or in society. And particularly when it comes to the Bible, I want to tell you, If you have a belief in an all-knowing God, a God who really is infinitely smart, then, given that belief, just because you can't understand why he gave a certain rule is no reason to disregard the rule. In fact, you should not understand a significant percentage of his rules fully. Just like my three-year-old daughter does not understand the rules that I give to her because I am much, much smarter than she is at this point. Her brain is still developing. She literally cannot fit certain concepts in her mind. The other day, she ran out of the house and started going as fast as she could. And by the time that, that an adult got to her, she was like 300 feet down the road at the corner of, two, of an intersection of two busy streets. She didn't understand why I yelled at her to come back. She came back, you hurt my feelings! <laughs> I was trying to prevent a car from hurting your spleen. Come in here. Um, Daddy is very frustrated with you right now because you made a very foolish choice and you can't understand why, but you need to know this. I give you these rules because I love you and I have a reason for them. And you need to trust that until you can understand. And so, 
I want to say this to those of you who confess that there is a God and believe that he is all-knowing and that the Bible is a revelation of his will. Just because you can't understand why he has certain rules about uh, heterosexual sex or homosexual sex or why he's got certain rules about saving sex till marriage, uh, that does not mean that you should ignore those rules. Love means waiting. That's what God has told us. And if you are feeling same-sex attractions, love means a lifetime of celibacy. That's what love means. To do something else is to be unloving. And that is a hard word for many of us to understand and embrace and accept. But the Bible is very clear on that point, and it is a very direct flow of logic. Now, if you reject that God is all known, reject that God exists, or reject the Bible's God's will, you have a lot of wiggle room. And I'd be happy to talk to you about any of those things, maybe in this meeting that we're trying to schedule with you over the next three weeks. But if you accept those three, you're locked in. And you need to realize that if love is the highest Christian virtue, the foundation of all that is ethical in Christian life, and that these are the outworkings of love, we need to abide by them if we want to live lives that are honoring to God and that are kind to those whom we claim to love. So, if you have delight and commitment, no action, I said you're like a football fan, what if you have delight and commitment, you really enjoy this person or this thing, but you're engaging in wrong action, not no action, but wrong action, what does that look like? You're like that incompetent friend on a sitcom who means well, but just botches everything up by the way you do things. It's like, you were supposed to watch your neighbor's cat, and so you watched it walk out in the middle of the road and get splatted. You follow the rules, and like, you know, you have to call your friend like, I'm so sorry! If you do these things wrong, then it is as counterproductive to your friends as if you had shown them no love at all. So, that's what love looks like. Commitment, delight, and action. Who do we show love to? Well, Jesus is very clear. I said we would come to this passage, verse 35 of Matthew chapter 22. One of them, one religious scholar, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. There are three parties in here that we're called to love. God, others, and ourselves, in that order in terms of, uh, of, of the way that we show preferential treatment to them. Uh, a theologian named Kenneth Boa puts it this way. The Christian's call is this, to love God completely, to love ourselves correctly, and to love others compassionately. It's a pretty good breakdown. Love God completely, love ourselves correctly, and love others compassionately. So, here's a question I have for you. How are you doing on each axis? How are you doing on loving God completely? Are you committed to Him? Are you in this for the long haul? Do you delight in God? Is worship and prayer one of the things that you relish in life? Or is it a chore? And do you take right actions towards Him? Do you, as the Bible says, worship Him in spirit and in truth? How are you doing on the love of God? And how are you doing on your love of self? Are you committed to being you? Now, that sounds like a silly question. But there are a lot of people on this campus who are committed to being someone else. They're committed to being the person their parents want them to be. They're committed to being the person that they think will get, catch the eye of that special someone. Or will be the person who will get into that specific you know, club or receive the specific scholarship. So they're, they're structuring their whole lives around this dream of who they think they need to be. Do you enjoy being you? Are you happy with who you are? You are made in the image of God and are loved by Him. Who you are is not an accident. If you loathe yourself, there's something desperately wrong on the inside, and you need to come before God and get that worked out. And then finally, do you take right actions towards yourself? Do you treat yourself well? Do you get enough sleep? Do you Sabbath? Do you take a break from all the work that piles in upon you and just trust God? Do you uh, eat well? Do you exercise? Are you showing love to yourself in practical ways? And then, 
most importantly, do you love others? Are you committed to the well-being of other people? Especially to those whom God has brought into your life in a special way. Your sweet mates, those in your hall, um, people in your lab, people that you have an ongoing relationship with. Are you committed to them regardless of how they treat you? Or whether they're committed to you in return? Christians are called to be initiators in love, not really responders. Do you enjoy it? Do you delight in them? Do you have fun? Now, I'm not talking about being an introvert or an extrovert here. I am way an introvert. I like people, though. This is what I'm getting at. There was a, a very famous uh, philosopher of whom he said, he was a lover of all mankind, but not a lover of men. He liked the world in abstract, but when he got around people, they annoyed him. <laughs> he didn't like people. You cannot claim to love God, whom you have not seen, and not love people who are made in his image that you see every day. It is an impossibility. You've got to have this delight. And if you don't have it, I'm not saying, you, make me like people. Pray. <laughs> Pray that God would put a delight for others in your heart. And maybe you'll stay an introvert and being around people too much is tiring for you. But there's a lot of things I enjoy doing that tire me. Uh, that, that, that's, that's irrelevant to whether you like people or not. And, if, and by the way, how do you learn to play the guitar? I play it a lot. Yeah. Uh, how do you learn to play soccer, Ava? Ava, uh, where are you? Where is Ava? There you go. Practice. Practice. Christina, how do you learn to sing? Now, you're noticing a trend here, right? <laughs> so how do you think you learn how to love? Yeah. Loving! Love As you do it, you'll get better at it. This is one of those things. Finally, actions. Are you actually doing things for others that are making their lives better? This is where Dick Foe's definition, I think, comes so helpful. Love is the accurate estimation and the adequate supply of another person's need. Are you consistently doing things that make others' lives better? Answer those nine questions. Three for God for yourself, be for others. And it's a pretty good indicator of how you're doing at the most important aspect of your Christian life, love. If you're like me, there's parts that are discouraging, parts that are encouraging. None of us has arrived at perfection yet. I want to take a bit of a turn right now. Uh, we're finishing this whole series. Love was the last stop. We talked about eight virtues. I would like to give you guys some time to reflect on those. So take that. Actually, if you can break into four chunks and pass it back and then pass it around, that would be a little faster. <laughs> um, did I give you? Whoa, I'll give you my notes. What did I give you? <laughs> I'd hate for you to find about the surprise secret finale. <laughs> Keep that goat hidden. Um, <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to go through each of these virtues and analyze how you're doing on them. So this is what that's going to look like. In fact, could you hand me one of those unless you pass that forward? I actually forgot to grab one myself. So I'm Thank you. Um, well, so along the left-hand side of your axis here, you've got, um, you've got a little bitty space for a graph. Now, Alan, if you could throw up. Um, this is my freshman life graph right here. Um, the, 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 so you got you got two, two fix, three fixed points upon this end, right? So you got one year ago today, the beginning of this quarter, and then you got today. So if you were like most prosh, see, I love Ava, so I saved your guitar. Um, see, if you were like most prosh, or most students actually. Uh, Stress level went up a lot once you got here and started getting into the groove. Like, first two weeks, oh, it's so much fun, I'm so scared, and then, wow, they give tests here. <laughs> Look at that. Whoa, that was tough. And it's just been building, 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 building. Sleep. You were a senior in high school, you were getting a good, you know, couple hours, and then summer came, oh, summer, ah! <laughs> so, what I want you to do is to do that for faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, etc. 
Um, now, this is going to drive both engineers and fuzzies up the wall. Okay. <laughs> engineers, you will note I have not labeled one of the axes at all. If it helps you, put Jesus at the top and Satan at the bottom. <laughs> if you need to do that, you go ahead. Um, or me, if you're feeling particularly persnickety. Um, now, fuzzies. I'm asking you to quantify a feeling. <laughs> this is meant to be helpful, not stressful, okay? Just do your best. Now, what I'll do is just walk through each one very quickly, and I want you to just sketch the first graph that comes to mind. This is one of those things where probably what's on the front of your mind is going to be closest to the truth. So, Faith, a year ago today, the beginning of this quarter and now, what is the chart of your trust in God? How deep does your trust run? Are you relying on Him in practical ways? Are you taking risks for Him in your life? Are you doing things that would not make sense to someone who did not believe in God? That is what faith looks like. How are you doing? Goodness. Are you living a life according to God's plan. If you were here when we talked about it, you remember, Lindsay defined goodness as fulfilling your purpose. A chair is a good chair if it keeps your bottom off the ground. A bed is a good bed if you can sleep comfortably in it. You are a good person if you are living life the way you were supposed to live it. Now that includes morality, but is not limited to it. Are you fulfilling your destiny? Are you making progress in that direction? Are you a good person? A year ago, started this quarter, and now, what is the trend line in your life? I'm not very interested in whether you like you give yourself a 7.3 on the 1 to 10 scale. I want to know what is this, what is what, what are the derivatives here? What's the second derivative? You can't give up, you can't give down. What's happening in your life? Knowledge. How are you doing in your understanding of God and the Bible? Are you growing in comprehension of who God is and what his will is for your life? A year ago? Game is for it now. What's the trend line? Self-control. Do you exercise discipline in your decision making? Both decisions in the moment. You know, am I going to eat this this donut or not? And decisions in the in the in the big picture. Who will I live with next year? <coughs> what will I do uh, in terms of major? Are you exercising dis discipline in your decision making? Perseverance. Remaining committed when you don't want to. If you remember that message, it's not perseverance unless you don't want to persevere. It's just called fun. <laughs> perseverance comes in when there's an obstacle in the way. How are you doing with the obstacles in your life? A year ago today, or if it helps from January 1st last year, we're close enough. Um, the beginning of this quarter, now. Godliness. We are called to be like God. However, at the same time, the sin in the garden was trying to be like God in the wrong way. We know the right way to be godly by looking at Jesus. Given that your mission is not to die for the sins of the world, what would Jesus do if he had your mission? If he was in your life? If he was living in this situation? That's what godliness means and looks like. Being Christ-like. Brotherly kindness. Uh, this was the message week before last, or well, week before, week before last. Uh, how are you doing at your commitment to authentic Christian community, towards your love for other believers, to relationships that are based on transparency and accountability, um, mutual striving for spiritual health? Is that a regular part of your life? Is it an increasing part of your life? Is it a value that you have? Or is it something you avoid? A year ago today, if you're a frosh, back when you were maybe a youth group, now, or the game's quarter, and now. And then finally, love. Uh, looking along the, the nine questions I asked you tonight, do you delight in and serve others over the long haul? Do you delight in and serve God over the long haul? And do you enjoy being here? Are you being here or made to be? Are you committed to doing that?
throughout. A year ago, it's a quarter. Now, where's your team? Come on back up. You see, we've been talking about this package all quarter long. And the thing that we read again and again and again, but that I, I'm afraid we haven't emphasized enough, is verse 8. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, then they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody's got some of these. Some level of each of these in their life. Everybody. The question is not, do you have some self-control? The question is, is your self-control growing or not? The question is not, do you love? Everybody loves something. Is your love growing, both in extent of who you love and in the capacity that you, you demonstrate that you, out of which you love? For each of these things, what is most vital for your spiritual health right now is what is the trend line in your life. Only you and God know. And actually, God knows better than you. There's a lot of self-deception that happens in these situations. I'm well aware of that. I know I frequently kid myself as to how I'm doing. If you have someone who's a close friend uh, who's known you for the last year, it would be risky but worthwhile to ask them how they think you're doing in some of these areas that are, that are observable by, by outsiders. This is my prayer for you. This is my hope for you. For everyone who hears my voice now and on the internet. By the way, if you're one of the people that listen to us on the internet, thank you so much. I want to tell you it's better live. We've got worship and everything. You should come check it out. Um, I've been wanting to say that for months, but I always forget. Seriously, we got, we got like this following on the internet of students who like, it's like that class where the professor puts the lectures online. And so you're like, I've got one thing to cut this week. What will I cut? That class. Don't do that. You're hurting me. Please. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know, if you can only make it this way, we understand. But please, check it out. Check it out. Um, this is my prayer for you. This is seriously my prayer. That the trend lines in your life would turn up. That you would be able to say, at the end of next quarter, I am more loving. I am more faithful. I am more self-controlled. I am more persevering. I am more kind to those in the family of God and committed to them. I am more go on down the list. If you do these things, if you grow in them, you will be effective and productive for Christ on campus. And the best part is the first verse. His divine power has given us everything we need. It remains only for us to take hold of that. And with his help, make every effort to grow in these things. Join me in prayer. Father.